Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Now we need to do it as old men as well. And I think we all need this. I think it's almost like pre-spiritual, some sort of closeness to the earth, some closeness to the sensory, the practical, the visceral, the beauty of the way the guitar sounds jangling over the lake. Because I remember those times. I remember, I remember what it was like. I think the things really went wrong when two things, social media, the internet was great before social media. Do you remember just, you'd go on websites and someone spent all this time putting together like a JFK website with all these documents and there's like a little message board in there and nobody really brought much of an ego to it. And, and it kept out really, it kept out all the, the, the normies, uh, no, like regular people didn't really want to go too far on the internet because there's this like bunch of information. This is just for nerds and, and obsessive people, right? So they just ignored it. But when social media came along, it, it gave a path for the banal vanities of everyone. And then it became gossipy rather than about ideas. Right. You know that quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, small minds talk about people, average minds talk about events and great minds talk about ideas. Wow. Well, yeah. I'd also be really interested to see when was social media like 2004 like that, I think is when, um, I would say really Facebook is, because my, my space was going, but my space wasn't really that much of an issue because the way of it was structured, it was more like an online boutique for, um, artists and musicians and such. And no one's really paying much attention to you if you don't really have a product to offer, at least in my experience. But uh, with Facebook, yeah. it just opened the door to everyone. But like I said, this sort of banal yeah. vanity of, of the every man and woman. And then the second blow, and, and this was the worst thing that, that could happen in combination, was putting the internet in your pocket and having it at reach at all times. So now that digital banal vanity is always accessible. And what that did for people's attention spans too. And it, yeah, it's a terrible combination. So I'm not saying I don't want to get rid of the internet. I'm not saying I, I don't want to use the internet anymore, but I want to use it more like what it was before social media. Use it for information to maybe professionally network on some level to share ideas. I don't like the social media aspect of it. And I certainly think that we shouldn't have it on our phones. None of us, like people say, oh, well, children shouldn't. No, none of us should have it. Uh, because yeah. we're not taking responsibility for, for our own failures and our own problems with it, which we all have. And of course we're going to have it because it, it is engineered to have an addictive element. They've even admitted to that. We make it as addictive as possible. So none of us should have it on the phones. It should be an effort. And I guarantee you, if we all had to go on our computer to go on Twitter or to go on Instagram or something like that, we wouldn't do it as much. Yeah. It's having it on the well, phone. There's a reason that many of the founders of social media platforms don't allow their own kids to be on it. Well, how evil is that? Getting, I'd really like to see a, the increase in like depressive drugs and things like that, I'll bet it coincides almost perfectly with the rise of social media. Mm, that's a complicated one. Certainly that would have made things worse and they're over prescribing increasingly more and more and more. I think there's always been, you know, well, at least for a very long time, there's been an issue with the pharmaceutical industry and, and like that they basically give doctors kickbacks to prescribe various drugs, right? So they've been over prescribing for a long time, particularly in the United States. Yeah. I worked for Pfizer for seven years, man. So I, not, not overly proud about that now, but yeah, I mean, it was yeah, everything from the marketing on the TV to how the, I mean, the, the reps didn't themselves didn't, but you know, there's, there was a lot of benefits of writing certain prescriptions. Hey, of okay, course, last thing, man. Last thing we're wrapping up. This is going to ask you an interesting question. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead. Okay, because because politically you tend to be on the right. So so here's a question for you, because what we're describing there it's it's an effect of capitalism, right? So how do you reconcile that? You know what? It's difficult, and I have to say that my attitude toward it now compared to when I was in it is a lot different. It's almost like love is blind kind of a scenario. You know, when you're in the thick of it, you don't really see. A lot of the negatives i don't know i think capitalism is it's kind of like a republic like what we have in the united states benjamin franklin basically 
when he came out of the room and it, it has a famous saying of the lady said, well, you know, Mr. Franklin, what kind of a government are we going to have? And he said, we're going to have a representative republic if we can keep it. And I think the key of what he was saying is our form of government can only really work. And even law enforcement and the rule of law only really work when the people have a moral foundation they can rely on. And I think capitalism is required of that as well. You know, there's a certain amount of moral fortitude that you have to have in, in order to do business ethically. So how do I reconcile being a pharmaceutical rep all those years? I, I was chasing the dollar and I don't really reconcile it. And now that I've been removed from it for 20 years and I've, I can look back and see kind of where pharmaceutical industry has gone along with, you know, many other industries, but holy crap, it's just one of those things where it seems like the bigger the industry and the more control they have and the more people they have in Washington that are affecting policy like that, it's dangerous. And, and assume that people doing it have morals, but ultimately I, I think the bigger the business gets, it's like big government, you know, it's, it loses its moral foundation, its purpose for actually existing. Yeah, that answer your question. Yeah, it's it's a good start. I mean, knowing that we have to wrap up, it's a whole other conversation to have. But I think that um, you know, this is where I am right now. Yeah. And I, I this is something I put to people on the right. I think we have sometimes been a little bit intellectually lazy with just saying things like, "Well, capitalism isn't a great system, but it's better than all other systems we have." It's like, well, that might be true, but don't use that to excuse the worst parts of it that we've thought our way out of things before. And so I, I think that I think that a necessary exercise for people on the right is just to start really looking at this in the face and, and saying, okay, like being honest about it, is this, can we do this in maybe some other, other form? Because yeah. right now, essentially it's the only duty that a, a business has, a corporation is to deliver profits to its shareholders and it has to grow. It must grow every quarter. So we well, just made a voracious psychopath, right? So right. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think of things that like one of the reasons away that rather than just cheering from one, for one side or the other, and this is something I put to people on the right, I think that's most of your viewers. It's like, yeah, we got to really well, start I mean, considering this. I, I, no, I agree with you. And I think that is one of the reasons that small business owners are so critical to any kind of a society, mm -hmm. uh, especially like the Western society. Because a small business owner, like like when my dad started MBAC Systems, for example, I think from day one, he knew he was on to something really good, something that was needed and it was effective. It was a good product, but he always emphasized to those of us that were on the sales and marketing, said, we are always going to keep our products to, you know, of course, as a company, we have to make money, but at the same time, we never want to outprice somebody just in order to make more money. So... We've always kept our costs and it reasonable as well as our price and our margins in order so that like for in the forensics industry, for example, we want MVACs to be available to even midsize and smaller agencies as opposed to only making it available for the really big ones like NYP. So I, I think that exists in small business far more than it does in the really big corporation. Mm. The issue is that the corporations get big by devouring small businesses, usually through unethical business practices, right? So it's like all when the you know, Man Street goes out of business because there's a Walmart. Right. Well, and that, it's a cycle. And I, I think the more people are aware of it, the more, well, and it, but again, our political side has to be, has to create the environment that makes it more readily available for people to start new businesses. When they get ideas, they start businesses. That enables a lot of individuals, which I think, frankly, like this current administration, one of the reasons they're doing some of the things they are is to make it difficult as possible for small businesses to survive. And, you know, as if the pandemic didn't destroy enough of them, like street vendor, you know, the best hot dogs you can find in New York are street vendors, and you almost can't even find them anymore. Because they're put on so many rules about selling food on the street? Like, what is the administration doing to make it difficult for small business owners? Well, there's a lot of regulations. They're mm. trying to hire 87,000 more IRS agents. Yeah. Any interaction on PayPal or something like that, it's over $600, open to audit, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the yeah. business environment, it's not 
in full swing yet, but it's certainly gearing up. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the last thing that I wanted to ask you, and let's wrap up with this, man. Well, first of all, I appreciate you making the time. I know it's late over there in Wales right now. So, but when you have this environment of all these combinations of things, social media, the isolation, you know, restricting your ability to say certain things, and then you compile, you know, you have that environment and then you throw something like, you know, when the pandemic hit us, why did so many people get even further isolated? And one of the things you said when, when we were together, you know, last year is we would not have accepted the lockdown if this other environment hadn't existed. Mm-hmm. So kind of let's wrap up on that thought. Yeah, I just think we were so used to staying indoors and being on computers all the time and having this highly technologically mediated interactional style and giving into our anxieties and fears and also to having a society where it's increasingly uncomfortable to have any sort of casual social interaction because everything that we do is being scrutinized to see if right we're a fascist or something in that orbit right and always ridiculously so with no understanding of of what that word means and and so when you put all these things together you had people hiding inside anyways, and the pandemic just gave them an excuse to do it longer. And then they could say, ha ha, I'm virtuous so, because I'm hiding when they were hiding anyway. All right. I, I'll tell you that the people that, you know, when I get on an airplane, I mean, literally, depending on where I'm flying into, I mean, it's not like you hardly see, you know, mass or anything like that. Holy crap. You fly into Philadelphia or New York or someplace like that. There's literally people that almost like give you dirty looks because you're not masked up. And mm-hmm. to me, it's like, it, it's just one more method in, and almost like a shield of isolation that the mass provided. And it's just, it's all compounding. And so I, I guess the, 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 you, my final question is what is the effect? All these things that are coming together that are basically here. I mean, we've kind of come out of the pandemic and out of the lockdowns, but still the damage that's been done. And psychologically, how do we overcome this stuff? You see, now we speak about we, like all of us, like internationally, as nations, like we can't even be in the same room. To, we, we can't even disagree on a highly, like an obviously disagreeable issue. We, we, can, we can't even converse. So the only we is, I think, you know, I, this, at this point in time, I'm starting with myself and my family and um, friends those friends, friends that are like on the edge of family. And that's all we got to work on now. But I think that really what people have to do is have to really take that time to think about, you know, maybe you heard something today. I hope you, I hope that your listeners that they heard something and they went, man, you know, there's, there's a point there and don't just go, well, that was interesting and move on to the next video. Really sit with yourself and, you know, go for a walk or something, take some time with it ask yourself, do you want to keep living like this? Because there is an option, you know, for a lot of us, we can choose to walk away. We might not be able to do it immediately, but you can put yourself on the course to being able to walk away from not being constantly staring at this glowing, cool, creating device, right? You can do that. Maybe not tomorrow, but you can take a step tomorrow that that gets you there in two years and you continue to take those steps. And the easiest thing to do is, is to hear something that rings true to you and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just default back to the old form. Right. So what I would like to do is right. I'd like to just spend more time away from this. So I'd like to build more fires, play more guitar, um, interact with people organically, person to person, read more, tell stories and, uh, and, and try and, and try and get people together to do that too. And, then maybe people will remember the the virtues of a life before the phone. Well, you know, I think well, certainly one of the things I'll do is at some point it's like, I don't know, it's pretty draconian, but you know, maybe when you come on this property, you can only use your phones in this room. Something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, corporate retreats and, but even family vacations. And we had a big family reunion at the end of last summer. And it was the last real big get together that I had before my mom passed away. And had we not done that, you know, we would have had some real regrets, but even more importantly, the amazing interaction that I had with cousins and siblings and 
nephews and nieces that I couldn't have had, I hadn't had for a long time. And it was fantastic memories. And yeah, it was just, just a ma- an amazing few days. So yeah, clearly all of us need to be doing a lot more of that. Oh, well, going to community theater, don't bring your phone with you. Don't sit there going, this is, but you know, because now we got the phone with us, like anything, anytime something's boring for a moment, that's like, oh, well, not as happening right now. I'll just go on my phone. If the phone's not there, you can't do that. And you can't miss everything that happens when you go to your phone for that moment. Um, so I think just leaving the phone at home or maybe leaving the phone out of m- most of your home. So you can't just walk around your house doing stuff on your phone all day. Like maybe this is the one place in your home that you can do it. And uh, don't do it at the dinner table. Don't do it when you're watching a film or something like that. Listening to music. Yeah, hey, Darren, man, people don't listen to music anymore. I'm not talking about putting music on while you're doing something else. I'm talking about sitting down and listening to music. Like, have you ever heard Jimi Hendrix's Axis Bulldoze Love album? That's what we're going to do right now. I'm putting it on. Let's listen to it together. People don't do that anymore. They act like that's ridiculous. It isn't. It's spiritual. Yeah. Well, you know, being able to, um, yeah, like you said, being able to unplug and actually become human again pretty critical stuff so well listen man this has been fantastic kept you a long time and uh, i just had to explore these topics with you again but I, like i said we missed about 14 different tangents that we could have gone off on so clearly we're gonna have to get together again and uh, talk about more so i appreciate you just uh you know wanted to say get you out there again and again make sure to send me those links you know, your books and stuff, because I think a lot of people would really benefit from exploring some of the knowledge that you've put out there. So yeah, we haven't really talked about much. <laughs> so there's, there's other aspects. Get my take okay. on me on, on like evil people, but yeah, I don't want to talk about them all the time either. No, you know what? I think ending on, you know, sitting down and listen to a, a Jimmy, Jimmy Jim yeah. album is a good place to end. It. So I mean, let's, yeah. let's uh, call it there and uh, we will, We will get together again, brother. Okay, look forward to it. Have a good night, Jared. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.